Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to our next set of notes. So this is going to be our introduction to genetics. So we went over um, DNA structure and function and now we're going to move into genetics. Um, now, up until now we have talked about DNA and we know that DNA exists and we know what it does and we know what it looks like. But really the ideas of genetics and heredity and how traits are passed from generation to generation came well before we even discovered DNA. And we also know that genetics is the branch of biology that studies heredity, so how traits are passed from generation to generation. Um, and now we're going to talk about just an introduction to genetics. So um, how it came about, who discovered it, um, what what he did, what his experiment was, all of those things. So the title for this set of notes, which you guys should have already written down, is called Mendelian Genetics. Okay, and it is called Mendelian Genetics after the famous scientist Gregor Mendel. Now, Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. Okay, and he was born in 1822. His parents were peasants. Um, and they had a background in agriculture. So Mendel, while he was in the monastery, while he lived in the monastery, was an expert botanist. So he is the person who grew all the food for the monastery. Um, and he studied plants while he was there. Um, he is called the father of genetics because he was one of the first people to study patterns of inheritance. So how genes are passed from one generation to the next. And what he did in order to study these patterns of inheritance was he actually did this by crossing pea plants. Now, what he would do was he would take a paintbrush, um, like as you see in the picture, and he would transfer pollen from one flowering pea plant to another flowering pea plant. Um, and you do it this way, so this way you know who the parents are. So if you transfer pollen from a purple pea plant to a white pea plant, you know who those parents are. It's a white and a purple pea plant. And you know specifically what plants that pollen is from. So that is why he did it that way. And what he was doing here was he was creating many monohybrid crosses. So let's break this word apart so we can figure out what it means. So mono means one. Hybrid is a cross of different traits. So he was creating one cross between different traits. Um, and this is what enabled him to really see the patterns that were occurring. Now, you might be asking yourself, why in the world did he choose pea plants? Okay? Um, pea plants are, were really an easy choice for him. Number one, because he, he was an expert botanist and he knew how to grow them really well. And number two, because um, the male and female parts of the pea plant are enclosed inside of the same flower. So it's very easy to control mating and what and how things go on. Um, so it was very easy to control the mating of the two different pea plants. Um, number two, so the peas are easy to grow and they grow very fast. So you're so they're not going to be killed by many things and they grow very fast so that way you can get your results in a in a um faster stance. Okay? So you don't have to wait as long to get your results and to gather your data. Um and they also produce lots of offspring inside every pea pod like you see at the top of the screen inside every pea pod there is a different pea, and those different peas contain the DNA from both of the parents. So it's lots of offspring that you get, okay? And then number three, each character of garden peas comes in two clearly different forms, okay? So, for example, you either have purple or white flowers. No other choices, okay? Their stems are either long or short, no other choices. You either have smooth peas or you have wrinkled peas. No other choice. That's your only option. Okay, so it was very easy for him to see which one was going to be a dominant and recessive trait. It was very easy for him to see what occurred. All right, so that is really the main reason why he chose peas. Now, Mendel, when he was gathering his results, when he was crossing his pea plants, he looked at the following characteristics. He looked at the flower color, so whether they were white or purple, 
he looked at the position on the stem, so whether it was at the top or, or whether it was along the branches. Um, he looked at the seed color, so whether they were yellow or green. He looked at the shape, whether they were round or wrinkled. He looked at the pod shape. Um, he looked at the pod color, so whether it was yellow or green. He looked at the stem length, whether it was long or short. So he looked at all of these things to determine his patterns. All right, so here's what he did. What he did was, first of all, he did a cross between two true bred individuals, a purple flower and a white flower. This first generation is called the P generation. So it consists of two true bred individuals that are crossed. So that's the P generation. P stands for parent, okay? Kind of like your parents cross to make you, okay? Just like in this instance, these two, these two parents, these two P plants cross to make their next generation, which is the offspring generation. So this is the F1 generation. So he crossed two P plants, a purple and a white, which is the P generation, and he got the F1 generation, okay? And what he figured out was that when these two were crossed, he got a purple flower, all right? Now, keep in mind that the reason this is called an F1 generation is because F stands for filial, which means son or daughter, which makes sense because when your parents had you, you were either the son or the daughter. Makes sense, okay? So that's the reason it's called the F1 generation is F stands for filial, all right? F, um, filial stands for son or daughter. Now, when he crossed these pea plants, he got a purple flower. Next, what he did was we... Remember how we talked about that pea plants are really easy to control for mating, okay, because they're all the male and the female parts are, con are contained within the same flower. So it was e really easy to self-pollinate that flower. So what he did was he self-pollinated that flower, and what he got was he was allowed to see that the F2 generation, when he got the F2 generation, um, he got three to one, three purple flowers and one white flower, all right? And when he looked at this, what he figured out was after looking at all of these generations, the P, the F1, the F2, after he looked at all of these, he figured out that there was a clear pattern that existed, okay? And from this clear pattern, he came up with two laws, two genetic laws. Number one is the law of segregation, which states that when genes are passed along, it's kind of like flipping a coin. There's a 50% chance you're going to get heads and a 50% chance you're going to get tails. When genes are passed along, it's a 50% chance you're going to get this. There's a 50% chance you're going to get that. Okay? Um, so the law of segregation is pretty much saying that when genes are passed along, there's a 50% chance that it's going to express in one way and a 50% chance that it will express in another way. So it's like flipping a coin, all right? And then number two is the law of, inter of independent assortment, all right? So the law of independent assortment states that genes are independent of one another. So like in pea plants, the um, gene for whether you have a long or a short stem does not affect whether your pea pod is yellow or green. Okay, in people, the gene for eye color does not affect the gene for hair color. They're totally independent of one another. They don't affect one another. Okay, moving on. All right, so what he figured out then was those two laws, and then he was puzzled by something. Because if you notice, I mean, what, what would you think? That if you crossed a purple flower with a purple flower, you're going to get all purple flowers. But that's not what happened. He got three purple flowers and one white flower. So what he figured out was that organisms can carry both forms of the same gene. You can have a white gene and a purple gene, but it just is expressed as purple. So this means that the purple is dominant over the white. One will mask the other. Okay, you, it's like you wear it on top of something. It's like you wear a coat, okay? 
um, you might have on a purple shirt, but you're wearing a black coat. The black coat is dominant over the purple shirt because it masks it. You can't see the purple shirt underneath it, okay? So what he said was that the reason you can get a white flower when you've crossed two purple flowers is one trait will mask the other trait. They can carry both forms, a dominant and a recessive form of the same trait. Now, that is saying that gets into alleles, okay? So this is what we call two forms of the same trait. An allele is just a different form of the same trait, okay? Each gene has two forms. Those two forms are called alleles, okay? You either have a dominant allele or you have a recessive allele. Those are your two forms, dominant or recessive, okay? So alleles are two forms of the same gene, two forms of the same trait. It's dominant or it's recessive. And you get these two alleles from who? Right, your mom and your dad, because that's who you get your DNA from. So it makes sense that your alleles would come from them, okay? So if your mom had blonde hair and your dad had brown hair, that would mean you're getting an allele for blonde hair and an allele for brown hair. One is dominant, one is recessive. You're getting two alleles, two forms of the same trait from your mom and your dad. All right? Next thing, dominant alleles. So when you write out these things, okay, because obviously you're going to have to write it out because there has to be a way for you to see it. Dominant alleles are always written as capital letters. That makes sense. Dominate is the winner. You think of it being better, okay? So dominant is bigger. You always write it as a capital letter. Recessive alleles are always written then as lowercase letters, okay? So, for example, tall pea plants are dominant to short pea plants, okay? So, when you pick out your letters, okay, so say it was T, all right, the tall is written as a capital T. The short is written as a lowercase t. All right, each individual carries two alleles or two letters, okay, because that's how we represent it. Okay, so for another example then, um, say I was comparing eye color, and I was saying that brown eyes are dominant to mm, blue eyes. They're recessive. All right, so how would I write that? All right, my brown eye color would be written as a capital B, right, because brown eyes are dominant to blue eyes, and then my blue would be written as a little b, okay, so brown would be represented by a capital B, and blue would be, would be represented by a lowercase b, all right, makes sense to you, okay, all right, moving on, now, genotypes and phenotypes, all right, genotypes, this is the genetic makeup of the individual. A good way to remember this is gene and genotype, or genetic and genotype, okay? Genotype is the genetic makeup of the individual. It's the individual's genes, okay? All right, generally there are more, there are three types of genotypes that an individual can have, okay? Generally, there are three types of genotypes that an individual can have, okay? They can either be homozygous, where their alleles are the exact same, so they have the exact same letter, okay? All right? And with that, they can either be homozygous dominant, where both of their alleles are the exact same letter, and since it's dominant, they're both capital letters, or they can be homozygous recessive, okay, where they're homozygous, so they're, they're the exact same letter, okay, and it's recessive, so they're both lowercase letters. Or the individual can be heterozygous, okay, so this is where the alleles are different. You have one capital letter and one lowercase letter, two very different things, all right? And then you have your phenotype, so this is how the gene is expressed. Whether you have blue eyes, brown eyes, um, brown hair, short hair, okay? This is the individual quality of it. This is the physical appearance. This is how it appears. It's the physical appearance, all right? Whether you're tall, short, blue eyes, brown eyes, brown hair, um, blonde hair, 
all right? All of those things. So it's the physical appearance. So the genotype is the genetic makeup, all right? You can either be homozygous, where the alleles are the exact same, and you can have homozygous dominant, which is where the, the letters are both the same, and they're capital, right? Because dominant is represented by a capital letter. Or you can be homozygous recessive, so this is where you have two lowercase letters, right? Letters are the exact same, and they're recessive, so that means you have a lowercase. Or they can be heterozygous, so the alleles are different. So you have a capital letter and a lowercase letter, all right? Now, what I want you to do is there is a slide in this where I would like you to create a table in your composition book, all right? So using the pea plants as an example, all right, fill in the following table, all right? So along the side, you have the genotype, so the homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. All right, now, figure out the allele combination. What are your letters going to look like, okay? And then your phenotype, what is it going to be, right? Because dominant always masks recessive. Remember that, dominant always masks recessive, all right? All right, take a second and do that. All right, now, here's what I want you to do. Look at your table that you just created. All right, and I'm going to give you the answer, so check it. All right, so if you have a genotype that is homozygous dominant, what are your letters going to look like? Okay, homozygous means the same. Dominant means it's capital. So you're going to have two capital T's, two capital T's, all right, and if dominant always masks recessive and you don't have a recessive gene and tall is the dominant trait, then it's going to be tall, okay, so your phenotype is going to be tall, all right, homozygous recessive, homo means the same, recessive means it's lowercase, so you're going to have two lowercase T's, and your phenotype since short, okay, is recessive, and the only way that a recessive trait can actually be expressed is if you have a homozygous recessive genotype, that means that it's going to be short, okay? You're going to have a short pea plant. All right, and for heterozygous, hetero means different, all right? So this means you're going to have two different letters. You're going to have a big T and a short T, okay? You're going to have a capital T and a lowercase t. And your phenotype, since dominant always masks recessive, is going to be what? Tall. Okay, good. Make sure you have that table correctly done in your notebook. All right, and next. All right, now, in order to really figure out what um, your genotype and your phenotype there is a man who came about called Reginald Punnett, okay? And this makes it, his, his way of doing this makes it so easy to figure out your genotypes and phenotypes because all it is is a matter of probability. It's so simple, okay? So, Mr. Punnett attended the University of Cambridge and earned a degree in zoology, and afterwards he worked at the university as, as an assistant studying livestock. And farmers already knew that when they bred two animals, the offspring received characteristics from each parent. However, they didn't know of genes or of DNA. So, but without even knowing about all of this, um, Mr. Punnett was able to prove that patterns of heredity existed among animals. And what he did was he charted out these experiences using what he called a Punnett square. All right, so now I'm going to teach you how to use Punnett squares. Now, with Punnett squares, Punnett squares are used to predict the outcomes among two crosses. So if you cross two things, or if you create a dihybrid cross, okay, you're going to get this. Punnett squares are used to determine the possible combinations that you're going to get with your offspring. Okay, so say in the picture we crossed um, a heterozygous tall pea plant with a homozygous recessive short pea plant. All right, what you do then 
is first, your alleles are separated and each gets its own column or row. Okay, so you write one combination along the side and one combination along the top. All right, the next thing you do is all you do is the alleles are simply dropped down and dragged over. Okay, so your alleles that are on top if you have a big T and a little t, your big T's are dragged down in that column and your little T's are dragged down in the next column. If on the side you have two little T's, your little T's are dragged over and so is your other little T. Okay, so simple. It's so easy. And then in each square, in each part of the box, you have um, your possible combinations for your offspring. Okay, it's so simple. If you need some help with that, call me over and I will be happy to help you. All right, now um, let's do a couple of example problems for you. All right, so here is what I want you to do. All right, the steps for solving genetic problems using Punnett squares. All right, we're going to do this one together. So this is going to be your first example problem. All right. The first one, in your step one, you have to determine the parental cross. So figure out your genotypes. What are the genotypes for your parents? What are their letters going to be? All right, are they homozygous? Are they heterozygous? Are they dominant? Are they recessive? You have to figure out your letters. What, your, what are your letters for your parents? All right, step two, you have to set up your Punnett square with the parental crosses. Okay, so set up your Punnett square. Draw the square, put your boxes in it. Put one parent on top, one parent on the side. All right? Then all you do is drag and drop. Fill in your Punnett square. Okay? So take your, um, take your genotype from the side and drag it across. Take your genotype at the top and drag it down. Then after that, all you do is determine the ratios. So if you have a 3 to 1 ratio with dominant being the one that's winning, write 3 to 1 dominant. Okay? If you have a... Um, one that's all recessive, right? Four recessive, okay? All you do is determine your ratios, all right? So let's do an example problem. So this next one, all right? In pea plants, round peas are dominant and wrinkle peas are recessive. Using the steps above, cross a plant, heterozygous for pea shape, and a homozygous dominant pea plant, all right? So we're crossing a heterozygous pea plant, and a homozygous dominant pea plant. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Okay? What you have to do, first step, determine your parental cross. You're crossing a heterozygous pea plant with a homozygous dominant pea plant. So let's take the first parent. They're heterozygous. Hetero means different. So that means you've got a big T and a little t. All right? Next parent is homozygous dominant. Homo means the same, dominant means big letters, so it's big T, big T. Easy enough, all right? Set up your Punnett square, all right? Draw your box, okay? Set, up, set it up with your parental crosses outside the box. So you've got big T, big T on the side or on the top, and big T, little t on the side or on the top, all right? Then all you do is drag and drop, fill in your square, so if you drag a big T and a big T, you're going to get big T, big T for your first offspring. You're dragging a big T and you're dropping a little T. So big T, little T is going to be your second uh, offspring. The next one, you're dragging a big T, you're dropping a big T. So it's going to be big T, big T is your third offspring. And in the next one, it's going to be big T, little T, right? Because you're dragging a big T and you're dropping your little T from the top. So it's big T, little T. All right, then all you have to do is determine your, determine your ratios. So your genotype ratios, 50% are homozygous dominant, 50% are heterozygous, right? You've got, you've got two out of four, right? That's 50%. Two out of four that are heterozygous, so they have a big T and a little t. And then you've got two out of four or 50% that are homozygous dominant. So they've go, both got two big T's. And then your phenotype. So what do they look like? Remember, dominant mass recessive. So 100% of it are going to be round. Okay? 100% of them are going to be round. That is so simple, easy enough. All right? 
Now, what I want you to do is, since we've done that one together, on the next um, one, two, three, four slides, okay, there are actually three slides, just three. There are some more examples for you to do. I want you to do these examples in your notebook. All right, do these examples in your notebook. All right, and then after that, at the beginning of class, I should have given you your homework for tonight. All right, it's dealing with probability and genetics. So what we just went over, so making Punnett squares and dealing with dominant and recessive genes and all that good stuff. All right, I want you to go ahead and get started on that once you're done with this, okay? Remember to write your questions down in your notebook. If you need any help, let me know. And off you go.